I'm very happy to introduce Tesca. So Tesca is a postdoctoral researcher at the Robotics Institute at CMU at Carnegie Mellon University uh, and a former PhD of Georgia Tech. And a research which is going to talk about us is in the intersection of human robot interaction and cognitive systems. So she's going to talk about task transfer with interactive robots and Tesca, give it a go. The stage is yours. All right, thank you. Let me set up my screen share. Okay. All right, can you all see my slides? Yes. Wonderful, thank you. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, this is uh, work that I have done mostly throughout my PhD. I'm currently a postdoc at CMU right now, uh, but I'll mostly be talking about my research uh, as a PhD student at Georgia Tech uh, and when visiting at UT Austin. Uh, so this work is talking about human guided task transfer for interactive robots. And what I want to talk about first is why interactive robots provide an interesting domain for task transfer. Historically, robots have been successfully applied to industrial environments where they perform routine tasks in isolated spaces. And you can see in some of these pictures that robots are actually uh, separated by metal cages away from uh, a human coworker uh, for the, uh, the human's own safety. So there's really like a guaranteed no interaction that's happening here. And because of that, we can guarantee that the robot's environment remains the same. However, there's been a lot of recent interest in incorporating robots into social everyday interactions with humans. And this includes domains such as healthcare, therapy, workspaces, and around the home. And as robots become more prevalent in human domains, it will be important that they can adapt to novelty as they're no longer existing in a controlled environment. This novelty can appear in many ways. For example, uh, the task goals during the fetching task, so changes in what the robot is fetching to deliver to a human, changes in the robot's motion that are necessary to adapt to new tool constraints, unexpected changes in task dynamics, such as uh, friction or weight, and variations in the appearances of objects. We see this a lot in product branding, uh, how uh, products will appear different on the box, uh, changes in lighting, uh, and just in general, other perceptual changes that affect how a robot should recognize uh, objects that are around it. What's important to note is that all of these variances each affect task execution in a different way, and thus must be addressed differently. In my research, I address this question of how a robot can adapt to various sources of novelty that it may encounter in human environments. To simplify this problem, we can say that the robot has learned some task in a source environment. So here the robot is learning how to scoop pasta from one bowl to another, uh, and it's learning it in this exact object configuration with these objects. At a later time, we might want the robot to repeat what it's learned, but in a slightly different setting that we refer to as the target environment. In this setting, uh, the blue bowl has been replaced by this red one that's been highlighted by the green circle. And for you and me, this is still a very easy problem to address because we know that these two bowls probably share the same purpose in the context of a scooping task, that this is the bowl that we want to scoop the pasta into. For a robot that has just learned this task, however, it doesn't know this. The question then becomes, how should the robot even know that these two objects correspond to each other and that the robot's scooping motion that it just learned doesn't have to be changed just because the bowl has been replaced? Ideally, we shouldn't have to hand specify this information to the robot, especially for every new environment that it might encounter. This question has been addressed in prior work using learning from demonstration, which addresses this problem by having a robot relearn a task using interaction with a human teacher. So here I'm guiding the robot's hand to complete the scooping task, and it's learning from the motion of its that is recording throughout its own arm. And while this is a very effective means of teaching a robot a task, ideally the robot shouldn't have to entirely relearn the task every time it encounters a novel situation. Prior work in machine learning has often focused on enabling a robot to learn over large amounts of prior knowledge, with the aim that this will allow a robot to then generalize to novel situations that are similar to the training examples, 
However, this requires that whoever is providing these training data examples, uh, they need to be able to foresee the situations that the robot will encounter. Uh, but it's impractical to assume that the robot has enough training data for enough tasks in enough demonstration states, and that the teacher is aware enough of all these different settings and knows what demonstrations to provide. My work relates most to a third perspective on this problem. Namely, how can a robot reason about the information that it needs in order to adapt what it does know to a particular target situation? And this approach is typically referred to as transfer. Another way of putting this is that rather than attempt to pre-train a robot for all task variations it will encounter, let's instead assume that a robot will inevitably encounter novelty that it is unprepared to address. Under this paradigm, the question then becomes, how can we enable a robot to reuse its task models in novel environments without requiring task-specific knowledge or extensive training data? And this is the question that I address in my research. Particularly, I look at this problem through the lens of interactive robots. As humans, we already know more about our environments than we could ever hope that a robot would learn. And we learn this through experience with countless variations of objects and tasks that we encounter in our everyday lives. Now, if we assume that the robot is operating around humans in human environments, the goal then is to enable a teacher, a human teacher, to impart contextual information that the robot cannot learn on its own. In this talk, I'll cover a few particular research projects that I've worked on. Uh, this slide provides a, a bit of an outline about what I'll be talking about, which first of all is this question of what is novelty? And I'll address this question by presenting a taxonomy of transfer problems that addresses the multiple task variances that a robot may encounter and the data that is required to address each of them. From this, I'll then discuss three different categories of transfer problems and the algorithms, data, and interactions between a robot and teacher that are needed to address each of them. Um, I don't have access to the chat, so if anybody has questions, feel free to unmute yourself, uh, and I'm happy to answer questions as I go. So first I wanna talk about this question of what is novelty and why does the source of novelty matter? So here at the left, we have an overhead view of that scooping environment where the robot was learning how to scoop pasta from one bowl to another. And this is the source environment where we assume a robot has just learned a task. We then want the robot to take what it's learned in that source environment and apply it to several different target environments. The first one might look like this where these objects have been moved around slightly, uh, but they haven't been replaced and ideally shouldn't change much about the, the motion that the robot uses to complete the scooping task. A more difficult transfer problem might look like this, where the red bull has been replaced by this black one, and there are several distractor objects that are irrelevant to the scene. An even more dissimilar problem might look like this, where in this setting, not only are objects replaced, but the scoop that the robot is using to complete the task has also been changed. And this changes how the robot actually performs the scooping motion in order to account for the new tool. And finally, we can eventually think of uh, a target environment that is so dissimilar from the source that the robot uh, now needs to completely relearn the task. In this case, there's actually nothing for the robot to scoop from or to. Uh, and so the task that it has learned is no longer applicable to the setting. But in thinking about tasks in this way as a spectrum of similarity between the source and target environment, the hypothesis that I wanted to test is whether there is a relationship between this similarity and the optimal abstraction of the robot's task representation that it should use for transfer. And finally, the amount of information that the robot needs in order to ground that abstracted representation in a particular target environment. This also requires us to think about how demonstrations are even represented in the first place. Given an end effector demonstration in a source environment like this, the robot can immediately model the trajectory of its motion, uh, in this case, a scooping motion, uh, as a set of keyframes or dynamic movement primitive. But rather than defining the, the, the robot's action model with respect to its uh, origin pose, we can parameterize these motions with respect to various objects in the scene. Uh, 
that parameterization must be performed after we have defined the state space. In this case, the state space can be uh, defined in terms of discrete objects. And that uh, feature selection process, the object classification process, occurs over the robot's raw perceptual input that, we, that it recorded during the demonstration. In my work, I've referred to this kind of representation as a tiered task abstraction, in which each element of the representation is parameterized by the next, and this represents data at multiple levels of abstraction. The primary benefit of this representation is that it allows us to use a single task model to address multiple transfer problems. So in the source environment, we expect that all four elements of this representation are recorded, but when transferring that representation to a target environment, not all of these aspects may apply to that target space. So in the setting where objects have been moved around, we expect that the majority of the representation is still applicable here. So the action model that represents the actual shape of the scooping motion is still valid. It's still parameterized by the same objects. Uh, and uh, the separation between these objects and the robot's motion remains the same. However, we now have to update uh, the actual position of these objects based on an observation of the new environment. In this setting here, the object labels themselves have changed due to the replaced objects. And so the model parameters have to be regrounded in a new set of object labels. And this could be done by identifying an object mapping containing the target objects that correspond to each of the source objects. In a setting like this where the scoop has been replaced, we expect that there's some aspect of the scooping motion that can still be preserved, namely the, uh, the shape of the robot's end effector motion to complete scooping, but it has to be re-parameterized in order to account for the new relationship between the objects in the scene and the robot's gripper, which now needs to be held higher above the table in order to not hit any of the objects with the new scoop. And so this parameterization function has to be replaced as well. But in this, this setting, these underlying action models, in this case represented as a DMP, can still be reused. And then eventually we get to a setting where uh, the problem is so dissimilar that we can no longer use any aspect of the robot's representation to address this problem. So we wanted to see how well do these different levels of abstraction actually match up to different categories of transfer problems. So I performed an evaluation addressing the three categories of transfer from the previous slide. Those were objects have been moved, objects have been moved and replaced, and objects have been moved, replaced, and the tool itself has been changed, which affects the relationship between the robot's gripper and the objects in the scene. And our main research question here was to see what data is actually needed in order to address all three of these categories of transfer problems. So in order to, to test this, we represented the task at these three different levels of abstraction and manually provided the data that was needed to ground each abstraction. We applied three abstractions to 10 variations of three different transfer problem categories. And the results indicated that all three abstractions successfully uh, completed the easiest problem category. That's where objects have been moved around. But what we see is that as the, as the transfer problem increases with difficulty, the task needs to be represented at a higher level of abstraction. And this is because as the source and the target environments become more dissimilar, more data needs to be grounded in the target environment. We see a similar relationship in the second task where the robot is aiming to set a table which completes a spatial relationship between objects. Overall, what this indicates is that the similarity between source and target environments can indicate the optimal level of abstraction for transfer. But what this also indicates is that there's a generality efficiency trade-off. So from looking at these results, we might think, well, why not just apply the most abstracted task representation to any transfer problem because it had the best performance in all three categories of problems. And the reason why we don't want to do that is that, again, as we abstract the task representation, we need more data to ground it in a new representation. In the context of this experiment, all of that grounding information was hand provided by us. But in a real robot setting, we would hope that the robot could obtain this information on its own, either through observation or through interaction with the teacher.
And so we get this trade-off where, yes, a more abstractive representation can be more generally applied, but we have to uh, we have to obtain more data in order to apply it to a new target situation. Which begs the question, where do we actually get this grounded knowledge? Again, we don't want to have this be hand specified by, uh, by the experimenters or by a human in order to allow a robot to transfer what it learned. Uh, so we want to see how can a robot actually gain this knowledge on its own. <clears throat> Considering that the domain of this work is interactive robots, we want to see how can we use continued interaction between the robot and the teacher to help the robot address this novelty. With that, I now want to consider one particular category of transfer problems that I've just discussed, that where objects have been replaced in the robot's uh, environment, and the robot now needs to be able to identify how the objects it was familiar with map to novel objects in its environment. And within this category of problems, we have to define the method of interaction that will provide the data that is necessary to ground the robot's abstracted task representation. Furthermore, I'll also discuss an algorithm for modeling and learning from this interaction data. So here we have a simplified overhead view of a source and target environment uh, where the robot has learned uh, you know, some task with these foam blocks at the left, and now we want it to recreate that task with these Lego blocks. In the context of a stacking task, we can map those source objects to target environments, or target objects in a way like this, uh, where we essentially map objects based on their size so that larger objects are stacked first, uh, followed by smaller and smaller ones. In the context of a different task, maybe one where we're uh, putting away blocks and sorting them by color, we use a different feature to identify this mapping. While this is a very simplified example, uh, this demonstrates how object mapping in real world tasks is a contextual problem. That is, we can't have a single similarity metric that tells us how uh, a source and target object should be aligned, but rather it depends on what task is being performed. Another reason why this uh, problem is a challenge is that uh, let's say that we have n uh, objects that we're trying to map to n target objects. Uh, the number of possible mappings for an n to n mapping problem is n factorial and can be evaluated in m different ways, where m is the number of features that we're considering uh, for uh, defining the similarity metric between objects. Without a known prior distribution of feature similarity, we have to evaluate all these possible feature combinations. As a result, this problem on its own is intractable without an appropriate similarity metric. And so our goal here is to infer a correct object mapping and to do so using minimal assistance from a human teacher. We do this by considering two different hypothesis spaces. One is a mapping hypothesis space consisting of all the possible mappings that the robot can consider. And we prune this space using interaction with the teacher. And we have a second hypothesis space uh, over the features that are relevant to that mapping. And we infer this hypothesis space also through interaction. So I wanna give you an idea of what this looks like in a real setting. Uh, here at the top, we have a teacher uh, demonstrating how to stack these different cups. So as they're providing this uh, demonstration of a stacking task, they're telling the robot when to open and close its gripper. And the robot is recording which objects it's moving to and from for each step of the task. Open your hand. At the bottom, we now have the robot receiving assistance at a later time. So while this is still a, a cup stacking task, this is a different set of cups than the robot originally learned. And so it doesn't know which objects to stack first. So now it's asking for assistance from a teacher by saying, which object do I use next? Where do I put this? Okay. And the teacher provides, in this case, assistance with every step of the task. Okay. 
What we want to do though is rather than have the robot request assistance for every step of the task, we want to see what is the minimal amount of assistance that the robot needs. So every time that the teacher points at an object or hands an object to the robot, that gives us a single mapping assist, where that assist gives us a single mapping between one source object that the robot would have used in the original setting and the object that the teacher just indicated that the robot should use. And we use this single mapping assistance to prune the mapping hypothesis space, as well as infer which features are responsible for that mapping assist that was just indicated by the teacher. And here we consider seven, uh, seven different perceptual features, but this is flexible to additional uh, features that may be considered. After each assist from the teacher, uh, we evaluate all remaining mapping and feature hypotheses to predict the most likely mapping from the assistance provided so far. And this can either continue with additional assistance or the robot can use its prediction to complete the rest of the task autonomously. Um, I'll go over this very briefly. Um, we performed a simulated extensive evaluation that used ground truth assistance and then an interactive evaluation where we used human provided assistance to see how does assistance from naive users affect the algorithm performance. And finally, we did an analysis of the robot's confidence over its assistance uh, and its confidence in its ability to predict the correct mapping afterward. In our simulated evaluation, uh, what we find is that uh, performance, uh, again, because this is a uh, intractable uh, size problem, uh, just randomly selecting a mapping provides very poor performance. But simply pruning the hypothesis space based on the teacher's assistance uh, results in much better performance. But again, we want to maximize the robot's performance when we only care about uh, you know, the robot using one or two assists from a teacher. And what we find is that the mapping by demonstration approach, which not only uses assistance to prune the hypothesis space, but also to infer the most likely perceptual feature uh, for that mapping hypothesis, results in better performance when very little assistance is available. So we can see that as the increase in performance when only one or two assists are available. We see much better performance from this mapping by demonstration approach. And we see similar trends, especially as we increase the number of objects that the robot has to map between, because again, this uh, drastically increases the number of possible mapping hypotheses that the robot has to consider. Uh, so what this indicates is that, that not only is interaction useful, but the method of modeling the data collected from interaction has a very distinct uh, result on performance as well. In that setting, the assistance was provided by an oracle, but we also wanted to see how is that approach affected by human provided data. So we performed a user study involving 10 participants demonstrating some pick and place tasks. Uh, and they provided assistance as was shown in that previous video where they either pointed objects or hand an object to the robot. What we wanted to see is how much assistance do we really need before the robot can predict the rest of the mapping autonomously. Uh, what we find is that for nine out of 10 instances of stacking, the robot only needed assistance with less than a quarter of the task, which would allow a robot to complete 75% of the task autonomously. For the sorting, for the sorting task, uh, the robot only needed assistance with the first half of the task. So in, practi uh, in practice, what this means is that most of the task can be completed autonomously. Uh, for some tasks, there's only one clear feature that is consistent across object pairs. So for the lunch task, the robot didn't need any assistance to predict that mapping autonomously. And in those cases, we want the robot to detect this and complete the whole task autonomously without requesting any assistance. So another way of looking at this is that some mapping problems can be addressed without any assistance. For others, the performance improves drastically after assistance. So in this case, particularly with the sorting task, which had the most objects to be mapped, which also results in uh, the most complex hypothesis space that the robot has to consider. But we also see this interesting trend where beyond a certain point, the mapping performance may actually decrease with additional assistance. 
And what this indicates to us is that interaction is useful but must be managed because as we continue to get more interaction from a teacher, uh, there's also additional opportunity for error to be introduced or uh, incorrect assistance to be inferred from that interaction. So based on this finding, we introduced a confidence threshold after which the robot would stop requesting assistance from a teacher. And what we see is that as that threshold increases, so does the number of requests for assistance from the teacher. Ideally, we should identify a threshold that results in minimizing the number of requests for assistance while also maximizing performance. And for all three of these tasks, we were actually able to identify a single threshold uh, that was optimal across all three tasks. And using this threshold that allows us to select the correct mapping in over 93% of cases. Another way of looking at this is that our goal is to maximize the robot's autonomy, uh, in which case the most autonomous method would be to allow the robot to uh, predict a mapping without any assistance from the teacher. And while sometimes this can result in good performance, such as for the lunch packing task, which is the simplest task uh, from a mapping perspective, it also results in very high variance in performance. If we instead want to maximize the number of correct mappings, then we would have the teacher re-demonstrate the entire task from scratch in every setting. And while that ensures that we're always getting the correct information, it also minimizes the robot's autonomy. It's completely uh, dependent on interaction with the teacher. What we find is that our confidence-guided mapping balances these two objectives, where we're able to maximize this combination of both the robot's autonomy and uh, correctness during mapping. Overall, what this tells us is that inferring relevant object features allows the agent to quickly identify the correct object mapping, and that this is particularly important as the problem size increases. A second interesting finding of this work is that more interaction is not always better. What we find is that uh, assistance provides mapping information within the context of the current task, but also needs to be moderated to minimize opportunity for error. And what we find is that using a confidence threshold informs the robot's decision to ask for additional assistance while also uh, maximizing its uh, performance and minimizing the amount of assistance that it needs from a teacher. So looking at another category of problems, uh, in this set of problems that we just looked at, uh, we're identifying a mapping between source and target objects, where the replacement of these objects does not necessarily affect how the robot uses the object. But now I want to talk about a second category of problems where this replaced object may affect how the robot actually completes the task. In particular, I'll talk about tool use. Uh, so in this case, we have a robot completing a sweeping task, and it was taught to complete a sweeping task using this paintbrush at the left, and later must transfer it to a scrub brush shown at the right. In this case, it's not enough for the robot to just know that a new tool is being used, but rather it also needs to learn how that affects the robot's motion. In this case, uh, when a new tool is being used, the actual tooltip or relevant surface of that tool is unknown. Assuming that the tooltip is at the same pose in these two frames, which is represented by the blue star, what we want to learn is the transform between the robot's end effector, uh, its actual gripper position, and that tooltip. This also applies to creative tool use. If we want the robot to use a new tool in a creative way, uh, we need to uh, we need to recognize when an atypical tool use or tooltip is being used. So for example, for a sweeping task, we can provide a demonstration of the task that results in a sweeping performance like this. And we then want the robot to be able to complete this task using a novel tool replacement. In this case, we're going to give it a creative tool to use, the side of a mug. And we provide it with corrections on how to transfer the model that it has just learned with the paintbrush in order to use this mug instead. <laughs> 
Throughout one round of these corrections, the robot steps through each keyframe of the task and pauses for the teacher to provide a correction with that new tool. As a result, this whole process results in a pair of poses, uh, one for the original pose and one for the corrected pose, and results in a K by two corrections matrix uh, where given K different keyframes, we have essentially the before and after pose provided by the correction at that keyframe. And our goal is to find the transform that minimizes the distance between the corrected trajectory and the transformed original trajectory. What we also found is that these corrections also indicate something about the task constraints at each point in the trajectory. Where some tasks are more constrained in the orientation of the tooltip, for example, here by Putting a paintbrush in a bin, we care about the orientation of that paintbrush. Whereas other tasks are more constrained in the position of the tooltip. So in a sweeping task, we care less about the orientation of this tool, but what we do care about is that the bristles of the brush are contacting the surface as the robot sweeps objects off of the table. Uh, what I hypothesize is that there are multiple types of constraints for tool task pairings of which these two settings are, are an example, one which is a more of an orientation constraint and another is a more of a rotational constraint where the robot's end effector rotates around the tooltip that is being used to complete that task. A challenge with this is that there's then a one-to-many relationship between the tooltip positions and the end effector poses that result in that tooltip position. So to address this, I propose two different models. Uh, so at the right, this is a 2D representation of a set of corrections, where each of these arrows indicates a, the X and Y change indicated by a correction, and the orientation of the arrow represents the change in orientation uh, provided in that correction. So what we see is that uh, these arrows appear to be pointing mostly in the same direction, with the exception of these two white arrows shown centered at 0, 0 and highlighted. These two points represent uh, keyframes that were not at all corrected. So they're centered at zero, zero, pointing at zero degrees. And that's because not all keyframes have to be corrected when using uh, a new tool. For example, if you're putting something away in a bin, uh, as you approach that bin, the robot's motion may not need to be corrected. But as it enters more constrained parts of that task, such as putting the tool in the bin, uh, that's when corrections are more likely to be necessary. So it's important that we have to uh, filter out these untransformed corrections while also producing a model of the typical transformation that was uh, implied by the remaining corrections. So to do this, we used RANSAC to simultaneously filter out uncorrected data points while also optimizing a linear model over the correction data. Uh, in this, and in this case, we performed RANSAC using an error function that minimizes the reconstruction error of a one-dimensional projection of the filtered corrections in this sample set. From which we can then sample a typical transformation position in that one-dimensional space and then obtain its corresponding orientation change. I also pro uh, propose a second model that's a rotational model where we see that corrections rotate around this end effector point. So we can see that these yellow arrows, uh, the orientation uh, of these arrows seems to be pointing at a central point, uh, which I've represented by the center point of the circle in this image. Uh, again, we use RANSAC in this case, but we change the arrow function to instead represent uh, these arrows uh, distance from a center of rotation model where we model the, the end effector pose or the, the tooltip pose that these end effector poses are rotating around. And we find the center of rotation by solving for the mean intersection of lines implied by these corrections. And once we've uh, modeled these data points, we then sample a typical transformation uh, by projecting a point from that center of rotation. Now, when we have both of these models, we assume that one of those models will be a better fit for a particular situation than the other. And so we also wanted to consider which of these two models uh, has, a, has a better fit for a particular set of data. 
Uh, and so our best fit model represents the one with the smallest range of correction values within their respective projected spaces. And that projected space is either in one dimensional PCA space for the linear model or uh, uh, the range of orientations with respect to a particular center of rotation. In our evaluation, we demonstrated tasks using these three tools at the top. So a hammer, a paintbrush, and a wrench. And we wanted to see how well can we transfer the tasks learned with those three tools to two novel tools represented by a scrub brush in a mug. In this evaluation, the robot receives a, key a keyframe demonstration of three different tasks, those being a hammering task, a sweeping task, and a hooking task. So something to note here is that all three of these tasks in this example are being performed with the same tool. And so we have some canonical tool uses using a hammer for hammering, while also introducing some atypical tool uses, such as using the side of a hammer for sweeping. Uh, and so the reason for this is that we want to highlight how, uh, how we can use atypical tool replacements or how a robot can reason over atypical tool replacements in order to use tools in a creative manner. The resulting demonstration uh, or the, the demonstration of the task results in a model that produces a trajectory that looks like this. And after providing corrections of that trajectory using the mug as a replacement tool, and then modeling those corrections using the linear or rotational models that I discussed previously, uh, that results in a new trajectory that looks like this. So what this indicates is that using a baseline of uh, not using any transform very rarely works. Uh, but applying either the linear or rotational models to transform the, the trajectory to a new tool uh, have a much better mean performance. But we also see that neither of these two models necessarily dominate in all of our tasks. So this demonstrates that different tool task pairings enforce different constraints. And so it's important to consider multiple methods for modeling these corrections. Tesca, I'm so yeah. sorry. Um, would you mind in one or two minutes just wrapping up because yeah, we also we'll have to do some Q&A, sorry. Yes, that sounds good. Uh, so what this shows is that using a best fit approach results in the best uh, overall best performance mean and variance, which highlights the importance of modeling different types of constraints so that they can be compared in a consistent way. We also looked at results at multiple thresholds of maximum performance. Uh, and so uh, looking at different uh, performance metrics for each task, such as the number of objects swept off the table uh, or uh, the amount to which the, the peg was hammered, uh, we see that we can achieve high performance in each of these tasks uh, in 72 or 62% of cases, depending on which threshold we look at. But aside from enabling high task performance, we also are interested in whether the system produces graceful degradation. Essentially, when the robot does not achieve the full task, does it at least complete part of it? And what we see is that transfer by correction offers much more robustness so that even in non-ideal performance, the robot still achieves part of the task, whereas the untransformed baseline produces all or nothing task behavior. We we're also curious to see whether we could transfer the corrections model learned on one task uh, onto a separate task. So in this case, the robot has received a correction of how to use the mug for the sweeping task, but it has received no information at all on how to use a mug for a hooking task. The trajectory that it's transforming looks like this, where it uses a paintbrush as a hook to move a box, and it applies the transform that it, that it learned on a completely different task in order to transfer that trajectory to use the mug as a hook as well. We wanted to see how often can we use these correction models in additional tasks without requiring any additional corrections or training data. Uh, and so what we see is that uh, this uh, kind of transfer is dependent on the relationship between tool tips and the task in which they're being used. Uh, so when we're using a single paintbrush to complete two tasks, 
there are two different tooltips that are being used here. One is the bristles that are used to sweep objects off of the surface. And another is this flat part of the paintbrush that's used as a hammer. And so there's an implicit tool transform or tool tip transform that occurs when we're transferring from one task to another. When we introduce a new tool, we can provide corrections on a single transform within that one task. So transferring how to sweep with a paintbrush to how to sweep with a scrub brush. And in a cross task transfer, we're essentially seeing whether we can reuse that relationship that was learned on one task in order to complete a second one. And what we find is that when this analogical relationship exists, we are able to reuse a task that the a task transform that the robot has already learned. And in these cases, uh, we see that uh, transfer is improved in 41% of problems when the tooltip is used in a similar manner, essentially when this analogical relationship is completed. Uh, just to sum this up, what we found is that these linear rotational models represent different tool task constraints. In our within task evaluation, we found that these models are sufficient to represent corrections in 72% of task executions. In our across task evaluation, we see that this model can be reused for a completely new task, allowing a robot to complete a new task with a new tool uh, without having ever received any demonstration or correction data. And that this is possible when uh, that task provides a similar context for the new tool. So to summarize throughout this talk, I've looked at what new information is needed to ground a task model in a new environment and how that can be obtained from interaction. Uh, I have other things I'm always happy to talk about in terms of future and ongoing work, uh, but at this point, I believe we're out of time and I am happy to take any questions. Thank you, Tesca. Uh, I think let us join in congratulations, Tesca, for, for the talk. Um, so if anyone has, I have a lot of questions, so, but if anyone has a question, please uh, raise your hand or write in the chat. Uh, okay, we have so many questions, so this is going to be uh, by order of appearance. So keep your hand up, please, and I will check. So uh, we have uh, Francisco has a question. Francisco. Yes. You can yes. unmute yourself. I would just kindly ask Tesca to stop sharing the screen, please. Oh, sure. Thank you. So good evening. First of all, thanks for the pre presentation. Very insightful. Uh, I have one question about mm, one of the videos because I, I'm what when when the robot was trying to to scoop uh, to scoop up on to scoop over the box by using a mug, I saw that at the at the beginning the um, the mug the, the cup was oriented in a certain way, but then just just straight uh, just just before starting to scoop, actually the, the robot changed the, the orientation of the cup. Is it something that mm, was, mm, that was, mm, it was like something pre-planned or was part of the transformation that was learned? Right, so that's a, that's a good observation. Uh, that second orientation that it moved to is part of the correction model that it learned. Uh, the original orientation was just like a standard pose that we reset all the tasks to. Uh, and so uh, essentially it was identifying that that was not the correct orientation based on the, the transform that it learned. So, but so that's, and, um, but um, so this kind of correction was that, was it applied from the demonstrator? So was the cup in that or in that wrong orientation initially, and then it, did it, did uh, the, the, um, the, the trainer corrected during the, the teaching? Right, so the transform is applied to the original demonstration on the first tool. And mm -hmm. so it's transforming that trajectory. So when I moved it to the reset pose, I'm just setting it at an arbitrary orientation. And then when it moves to the first pose of its corrected or its transformed trajectory mm -hmm. for the new tool, that's where it moves to that first orientation change. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, that was my question. Thank you, thank you so much. Sure thing. Thank you so much. Uh, anyone else has a question they would like to uh, ask? No? Okay. We have a, a dedicated Slack channel for Tesca's um, talk. So if you are interested in, in asking questions to Tesca about her work, 
um, please do so also in the in the Slack channel. Um, I, I just have one final question, just for curiosity. Um, so when you were talking about your tiered uh, task abstractions, my question would be: How could an agent like a robot evaluate what in which level he should start? Right. Yes. It, it seemed like the, the, the knowledge was fed to him, right? Which tier he is. How could a robot like evaluate that autonomously? Yes, I was hoping somebody would ask this question because um, that is actually part of ongoing work that I'm doing. We literally just had a paper accepted this morning on this topic, which I'm very excited about. Um, that, the other reason I'm interested in this problem is that it's actually, it's much more complicated than identifying which level of abstraction. And the reason why is that there's several ways of looking at this problem. We can look at it in terms of the similarity between the source and target environments, which is more of a perceptual point of view, or we can reason about it from the opposite perspective, which is here are all the interaction types that allow us to obtain data. And we want to reason over which of those interaction types gives us the data that we need for a particular problem. So it's sort of like two ways of looking at it. Um, this paper that we just had accepted talks about uh, that second perspective, which is looking at all these interaction types how can we reason over the data that they provide and then reason about what data is needed for a particular transfer problem. Uh, and so that's in my ongoing work. Uh, we've recently formalized like what information those interaction types can provide. And right now I'm doing that second step of saying, okay, given all this data, how do we actually, or all these different types of data we can obtain through interaction, how do we actually identify uh, what is the best map match for a particular problem? Okay, thank you. Sana, you have a question, go for it, very quickly. Yes, very quickly. <laughs> Hi, thanks for your talk. Um, maybe it's kind of related to the previous question, but it's kind of uh, about how you, now I think you are still um, handcrafting the features or inputting the features manually, right? So maybe have you already thought about also getting these features autonomously so that, you know, if you have a new environment uh, or a new task, you know which features are important, maybe you learn that from interaction as well or human input? Right. Do you mean perceptual features? Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so in this case, we, uh, we used seven predefined features where this represents uh, three different categories of feature types actually. So there's like raw perceptual features like you know um, the dimensions of an object, the color of the object. There are also um, things that represent or features that represent relationships. So like a uh, you know, this object is to the left of this other object. So more of like a uh, representation of that, uh, as well as derived features such as change in objects, size or pose or things like that. Um, so what we found is that those three categories of features uh, gave us a lot of breadth in terms of features that might be relevant to a task. Uh, but we did intend for this to be open to additional feature additions. So uh, particularly uh, in uh, you know, computer vision, there's been a lot of other uh, features that may not be uh, recognizable to you and I, but are still relevant to a task, or maybe something like, uh, represent something like the concavity of an object or uh, the surface of an object. And so we didn't consider those uh, just because they weren't necessary for the tasks that we evaluated, uh, but the approach is broad enough to be able to apply to features like that. Cool, thanks. Great work, Elsa. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for your question. Uh, unfortunately, we have to wrap up this session, but uh, I would please join me in congratulating once again, Tasca, for the talk. It was a great, great talk. Um, and I would just kindly take two more or one more minute of your time to just introduce our next speaker. Um, okay, so. All right, thank you. Okay, so in two weeks, we're going to have Shruti, Shruti Chandra. She's a postdoctor fellow at the CER Lab, University of Waterloo, and she'll be talking about child robot interaction. Okay, so if you are interested in that uh, topic, you don't want to miss this talk. Um, and it's not going to be on the 2nd of April, but it's going to be in two weeks. Okay, 
Um, once again, if you like our talks and you want to support us, this is just for infrastructure costs like the Zoom uh, that we are currently uh, account that we're currently using. Please free, free, feel free to, to, to support us. Uh, and having said that, thank you so much and see you in two weeks. Thank you all. Bye everyone. Bye Tesca.